Great is his faithfulness. New every morning. Imagine that. Doesn't it look better in the morning, all those hard days, and you're wondering, what are we going to make it through? Is God going to walk us through this? And in the morning, it all looks a little bit better, doesn't it? Yeah. Because in my mornings, it's about 3.30 that I wake up with all the crisis. And at 6.30, I get up and actually stand up, and it's like, what was I even thinking about? Isn't it amazing? God's faithfulness looking after us. I feel very much that God has been faithful to Heather and I. Uh, we have just moved to New Glasgow, or from New Glasgow to Bible Hill and uh, moved into a beautiful new home there and really enjoying it. And uh, we get the opportunity to, uh, you probably don't know us very well at all, but we're flying out to Winnipeg in a few weeks to be at our son's uh, wedding and uh, never thought he'd get married. Never thought they'd be with a child either, and they are. So we have all kinds of things to celebrate in the coming week, as well as a funeral that we have to go to Thunder Bay for. So God is just watching over us as he always does. And it is good to be with you here today. It's also good to be here in kind of a royalty situation. The Matawanas, of course, you just know them as uh, Joel and uh, his wife. And I, I, it's an, an N word, but I can't remember your name. <laughs> Nora. It is Nora. Okay, I had, two, I had two names, Nora or Naomi. I couldn't figure out which one it was, so good to have you with us. And so for Canadian Baptist Ministries, of whom I'm representing today, I'm just glad to be here. We see God's faithfulness on a regular basis, and we celebrate with churches like yours because you need to know the stories that you're a part of. You are very much a part of Canadian Baptist Ministries. The uh, Grow Hope Project will go to us at the end of it all. And we'll use it to help feed people around the world. And I'll explain a little bit more of that as we go along. So I should probably get to our first slides. But um, I have, Heather and I have a very dear friend out west in Manitoba, Brandon. And he is a chef. Now, he's, he's more than a chef. He is competitive. He competes in Europe uh, at, a, at basically a cooking Olympics. He, is a, he was a teacher of culinary arts at the local high school. And if you ask him to feed you, you will be fed. <laughs> Unlike most of us, when we're feeding people, we kind of think of amounts and numbers and think, okay, well, we're having four people over, so we need four potatoes. He puts 40 potatoes together. He just has never learned how to make smaller. And so it's amazing to watch. So when we would know that he was cooking at the church or he was going to bring stuff from home or if he was going to have a, a gathering and we were going to have him cook for us, we knew some really important things. We knew that we were going to eat really well, that there was going to be lots of it, and that we should bring Tupperware containers to take it home <laughs> because he always had too much. And then on top of it, like the chefs of old, when they had too much, once it was done, it went in the garbage. And he was on to the next project. Never thought twice about all the food that went out. And so over time, we sort of taught him, or he learned, or the social norms have changed, that the food doesn't get thrown out anymore, and we can't bring Tupperware containers anymore. Because it goes to the local shelter, or it goes to the local homeless people, or it goes out to other people who really need it, and I really don't need it in my freezer, but I sure do miss it. It was well done. School cafeterias are like businesses, and they often end up trying to guess how many students they're going to feed in the day. And so what they do is they, they sort of estimate, and they put out their best cafeteria food, of which is of questionable quality at times. Other times it's really good, I'm not going to argue. Um, but they never know how much is going to go. And so at the end of the day, they often have food left over, and they're trying to figure out, well, what do we do with this? And there was a school in the States that decided they really didn't like throwing out the food. They wanted it to go to good causes because they knew that there were children in their school that were going to go home and they were going to be hungry that night. And so they said, how can we help them? And so they got together with another organization, most likely a church, and they said, how can we do this? What can we do? And the church said, you know what we can do? We can come in after you're done and we'll put it all into packages. We'll just put it into simple plastic containers. We'll put it in a fridge here at the school, and we'll distribute it for you. A really simple remedy. And a lot of those children went home with a little package of plastic food, well, not plastic food, but plastic containers with food inside, 
knowing that they were loved on a little bit, cared for, that the school cared about them, and that somebody was reaching out to them. What a great principle for helping when you have too much of something. How can you help? I, I really loved that concept. It's basically the KISS principle. Keep it simple. We're not allowed to use the other word anymore, so we'll just keep it simple, okay? And if you can find ways to do that, you can make a difference in the world. A lot of the work that Canadian Baptist Ministries does is right on the KISS principle. It's local churches who see a problem, and they say, how can we solve this? And then they ask CBM to come alongside to stand with them to see, okay, how can we do it? And so you'll see some foods up there. There's one particular plate. I forgot I put it in there. Down there in the corner. That was fresh snails in the Philippines. They had picked them in the morning. And so I made sure I had some at noon hour. And they were okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't travel for them, but they were interesting to eat, for sure. And the people were so pleased to be able to feed us their specialties. And I've got to tell you, um, the pulpit is always the hottest and the driest place in the room. I've got to tell you, that Philippine uh, church was the hottest I have ever experienced anywhere. It was in the 40s, and it was nasty. <laughs> I was just running, because I'm from Canada, and I don't, I'm not used to heat like that. But what a great experience to share with a congregation just like this. They love Jesus. They want to share Jesus with their children. They want to share Jesus with their neighbors. They want to share the good news of Christ, and they want to help people along the way. That's what we do as churches, isn't it? We help people, and we care for them. The scriptures are very helpful on this. This particular scripture is from 2 Corinthians, and the Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. He's already written them once, and now he's sending back a second letter. Now, Paul kind of likes to sort of give it to them every once in a while, and in this particular case, he's, he's trying to help them. What's happened is a very poor church in Macedonia has sent some money along to Jerusalem, Jerusalem is really struggling at this time in history. It's in the mid-50s uh, AD, and they are being persecuted because the Christians, as soon as they left Judaism, the Jewish people really gave them a hard time. They did not like the fact that they were becoming Messianic Jews, that they were becoming followers of the Messiah. And so they were being ostracized from their family and from their churches. There was also famine in the land. Jerusalem was under some really heavy attacks from Rome and from their own people. And so there was heavy taxation and there wasn't a lot of food. So Jerusalem was suffering as it would suffer at different times in history. And so in this particular time, Paul writes to the Corinthian church. He says, you need to help your brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. And the scripture goes like this. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. The concern here is about equality. Now, when we see the word equality, we get, a, we get our backs up a little bit because we, we say, well, hold it now. We're, we're doing well. What do you mean? Do we have to share all of our wealth with those who don't have anything? How, how does this work? And, and in Canadian and in American and in European thinking, we're trying to figure out the word equality. And I think that if we look at it closely, there's another word that we can use here. And the English Standard Version uses it. Instead of equality, it uses the word fairness. It's fair. If you have too much, it's only fair that you share with those who are struggling. It's only fair to reach out and help those and give them a hand up. Sometimes you'll never see them. We send money all around the world to help with CBM, and we help with situations in the Philippines that you would never know how we help but we do it because we have much, they have little, and we can share. It's pretty straightforward. It's kind of a biblical concept. You'll read it throughout scripture, just to share, just to, to be kind with one another. So as we think of that, there's an ebb and flow to the scripture passage that goes back and forth a bit, but it's basically saying, if you are doing well, share with those who are not, because in the future, you may not be doing so well, and they may need to share with you. Now, we get our kind of uppity about that here in Canada and here in North America. 
whoa, we always have everything, right? But there are people here who are struggling. And there may be a time when bad things happen here. I send you back to um, Bosnia. There was a country that helped to host the Olympics. And just 10 years later, they're totally enveloped in a war, a civil war that broke them apart. They're still trying to get over. So countries that are successful and doing well fall. So we need to keep that in mind that we share when we have stuff to share and when we receive when we need to receive. God is good. God is faithful. And we too can be faithful to those around us. So that's the teaching moment behind this on the scripture side. I, uh, I titled this sermon, It's Fair to Share. Please help me find a better sermon title. It's just totally weak. It rhymes, but that's about all. If you have a better way of saying it, please help me, because I'd love to have a little better capture, because I think it is good to be fair. I think it is good to share, but the words together don't work so good. We really do desire to help, to do good in a world where so much need is identified. We can help, and we can make a difference. To share that concept, I'd like to show a video right now, and it's our executive director, Jennifer Lau, and she's sharing some of the work that CBM has done over the last year. One of the things before it is played, I want you to understand, is Canadian Baptist Ministries is an outpouring of churches just like this. 150 years ago, churches like this one said, we need to do mission overseas. And they joined together all across Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, all across Ontario and Quebec, right across to the western provinces. And they joined together and they formed an organization basically called Canadian Baptist Ministries. And so what we've done is we've worked together over these years. So this is a story. This video is your video. Please enjoy it because next year is 150th years of our working as one. And so we want to share that video. Hello friends, we are grateful for your partnership and I want to take a moment to reflect on how you've helped us make meaningful impact this past year. We especially think of your faithfulness in the face of numerous challenges in our world and want to express our heartfelt thanks for your generosity to help those in need. Conflicts, political divisions, war, extreme weather events, rising inflation and hunger are just some of the difficulties people continue to encounter. It's easy to look at these challenges as impossible to overcome, but we serve the God of the impossible and we continue to trust that he is in control. In 2022, you brought hope to vulnerable communities by empowering women, ensuring access to education, assisting refugees, helping to set up small businesses and building up local churches. The Ukrainian Baptist Church remains one of the largest networks within Ukraine that is providing aid during this ongoing war. Despite 300 Baptist churches having to close because of the war, the community of believers continues to thrive in the face of tragedy and hardship. Igor Bandura, the Vice President of the Ukrainian Baptist Union, says that although he wishes God hadn't chosen their country to endure these struggles, he believes that God is at work in Ukraine. He has asked us to pray with them as they continue to serve in the midst of the war, but also as they plan for renewal and rebuilding afterward. Our goal is to respond to adversity with God's practical message of love. It is a message that is needed now more than ever as we face other crises, particularly in the wake of the Turkey-Syria earthquake. Together, we can overcome despair with God's hope it is a hope that rises anew each day and gives us reasons to praise him in the midst of struggles. Looking ahead, we celebrate as we move forward into partnerships with the Togo Baptist Convention in West Africa and the Egyptian Baptist Convention. In addition, 
After years of interaction, we're happy to report a full partnership with Operation Dawn in Thailand, a gospel-based drug rehabilitation program. None of these ministry initiatives would be possible without your steadfast prayers and support. Thank you for partnering with us to embrace a broken world through word and deed. So we have an opportunity by watching that video to sort of ponder some of the work that we do together to make a difference in the name of Jesus Christ. We work in over 18 different countries. Uh, the slide doesn't show very well, but at least you can see the list of it. And also Jennifer has just mentioned that we're starting work in Togo and in uh, Egypt. Uh, there's also some work beginning in Liberia as well. We're working in different countries around the world where we have partnerships. One of the important aspects of Canadian Baptist is that we like to work with people that we know, that we trust, that we can follow, and we can work alongside. So we tend not to just stand back and, and throw thing, money at things. We, we really want to know the partnership. We really want to know the people. So we only work in those 18 countries, and, uh, but those are good, strong relationships, and they're well built over the time. Um, we want to help where God is calling us to go, and so these, these churches make a difference. The, one of the main things with CBM that you as a church said to us is that the word of God has to go forward. You cannot be a mission agency and not be sharing God's word, but you can't just share God's word and not help people. So there's always been a tension in mission, is word and deed. You know, are we sharing the word enough? Are we doing enough deeds? How are we working that together? It's changed over years. 150 years ago, we were the ones standing on the street corner sharing the gospel, saying, you need Jesus. And when we did that, we recognized that people still needed Jesus, but they also needed medical care. And a lot of the countries where we went to, and initially India especially, we brought a lot of medical care and a lot of education and things like that while we shared the gospel. And the churches grew, and they grew, and they grew, and they formed associations and denominations, and they are far larger than Canadian Baptists are three denominations across Canada. There are about 900 to 1,000 churches. They are in the thousands of churches in India and in Bolivia and in Kenya, Rwanda, uh, all of the different countries where we work. We have large partnerships with big denominations, which had started by hearing the word of God, and then we did the deeds and helped them, and they grew. And they're doing well, and they're thriving. And uh, they do this amazing work, especially around evangelism. A national field staff or a national person who's working in the churches, they have a love for Jesus, and they're not afraid to share it. And it's amazing to watch as a national person works with their families, works with their friends, and shares the good news of Jesus Christ, and they do it so well. And then we help people as we go along. So that's kind of how we work. Jennifer mentioned the five causes very quickly, but we work in poverty, we work in justice issues, we work around kids at risk. Building the local church is one of the largest things that we do, is how do we help local pastors build their churches? How do we help local pastors get their theology and their understanding? And then emergency relief. So I'm just gonna give you some highlights on that as we go through. This, uh, this woman is um, Mrs. Uh, Namwizi, and she was at one of the classes that our partners held and we were able to support. And she learned about crop management in a very really difficult situation. And she learned that if she did some simple things, she could change. So when she came back to her, her, her crops and to her farm, she basically pulled out the crops that they used to grow. She pulled out the, uh, uh, the sugar cane plants and the eucalyptus plants and she planted vegetables. And she planted tomatoes and cabbages, and she began growing them using the techniques that she had learned at the class. And what happened was, very quickly, she began to produce much better crop. And she was able, with that, to be able to become part of the local savings and loans group that saved a dollar a week for a year. So it doesn't sound like much, but it's a start. So basically, what happened was, she was doing so well with her crops, and her neighbors were not. 
She managed to work through a drought year and come out at the other end with tomatoes and cabbages and to do successful farming. And she was able then to make that savings. And she was able to buy, I think what she bought was a pig the next year. And the pig gave her the opportunity to grow her farm and to do much better. But it's really simple things. But she needed, someone needs to start. And so farmers like her were able to start little plots of land and do much better than their neighbors because they were trying new, new crops, new ways of conservation, and she's done well. And she said at the end of it that it was much easier than, than she thought it was going to be to do, but it made so much more sense. And people followed her and talked to her about it, and other farmers are joining her now, and she's doing much better. Getting somebody out of poverty, we have to remember a couple things about poverty. Poverty isn't an end state. Just because you're poor and you're in poverty doesn't mean you have to stay there. If you go out to the prairies, we have some prairie backgrounds, the roots out of Manitoba and Saskatchewan. The turn of the 19th century, there was a lot of poverty on the prairies. Those farmers were dirt farmers. They were poor and they were struggling. But over time, those crops came around. And over time, they learned how to do it better. And then they are very successful. Poverty doesn't remain. And you'll see that here in, in, even in Nova Scotia. We have poverty for sure, but we work out of it. And it's the same around the world. Just because a country is in poverty now doesn't mean they will always be in poverty. And there's hope and there's a future. And so we do it in very simple ways. Uh, kitchen gardens is another way we do a lot of it. Just teaching people how to do a simple garden. That changes things. Or we give somebody chickens. I have a slide that I often use. I think I showed it here before, so I didn't choose the slide. Show it. But giving somebody chickens and letting them raise chickens and poultry and then seeing that turn into the purchase of a goat and then that into the purchase of a cow and just to see the, the way that people work themselves out of poverty. We do that on a regular basis because of the mandate to help people where they are. And we're able to share the gospel as we go with that. Justice issues are something else that we do a lot of. This is Reverend Gatto, and he's with the leadership of the CBCA and CEBC. And essentially, these two groups were one Baptist denomination about 30, 20 years ago. And they fell apart. They divided. They didn't want to play together anymore. They didn't want to work together and it was over tribal differences. There are two very different tribes represented here, and they don't play well together. And they're nas nationally, they don't work well together either. So these two denominations split apart. But over the last number of years, they have said this was, this was and this is wrong. We need to start to work together. It was wrong. It was racism at its worst. And so these two groups gather together, and Reverend Gatto, one of our leaders, help them to look at justice issues and look at racism and prejudice and how do we work together and how do we work through things. And they're coming back, and they've signed a, a letter of working together. Unfortunately, at the same time, those two tribes have blown up against each other again. So we're waiting to see how our Baptist work does in the middle of it all. But these are the real things that we face uh, around the world and try to help as we go. So justice issues. If you see something that just isn't right, that's likely a justice issue. And we work in a lot of those um, around the world. Kids at risk, an ongoing situation, of course. Everywhere we go, we have children. There's, the population of children around the world is so immense and huge. But during COVID, a lot of those children ended up being pushed aside and not able to go to school, not able to get out of their homes. Some of the countries in the world were pretty brutal. Um, we think Canada was bad. Bolivia, you weren't allowed out of your house. You could go out one morning a week and it depended on the, the end of your name and that was it. That was, you had to go shopping, you had to do whatever you needed to do and you had to get it done all in one morning. It was really tough. So the children were locked down as well and they don't always have good electronics where they can go to school online. So a lot of kids basically just didn't end up in school. Uh, CBM with, with our partners were able to do some work in those areas, but it was, it was very difficult. And so we've been spending a lot of time this last year, a couple of years, trying to get kids back into school. They want to go back. COVID has held them back. The economy of the country is, is really a big issue, but we're getting them back in there slowly but surely. And last year we did something called Active Admission. If you get a chance to jump on board this year, we're going to be raising funds for food this year. So another important uh, element of the work we do. 
These are some of the kids that we work with. We do a lot of work around tutoring, just getting that first bit of education into the children before they actually go to school. Kids in poverty have a hard enough time going to a regular school system. So if we can give them just a little bit of a starter, it helps. And one of the things we do in, uh, in the Philippines especially is we have these classes where the kids three to five years old go and we teach them you know, the, how to uh, the alphabet and we teach them some of the basics. But what's so cool is moms in the Philippines don't like to let their children go unless they're being well supervised. And so the moms are often in the windows around the little classroom that we have and they're learning but and they're watching over their kids and then we get a chance to often share the gospel with them or we'll share some hygiene tricks or we'll help them with just some basics and so we get to do a lot of teaching with adults at the same time as we're working with these children so it's a really important part of the ministry that we do and then building the church, I've already shared this with you, that we work a lot with pastors around the world. This is Pastor Jose from Guatemala. He is just a classic old pastor, just, just like Borden. I mean, just a good old guy, kind of classic. He's got his church, he's doing his work, everything's good. And then he went away to a class, a class that the, the, the denomination and CBM was hosting, saying, how can you work in your church, but how can you break down the walls of your church and get out into your community? And Jose learned at that, that gathering, and he learned a lot, just like Borden learns. And he started to pull down the walls of his church. And the, the writer, the, the National Field Staff, who was watching over this said, it's like a palpable difference. The church was always, oh, it's right around here. It's where the pastor is, it's right here. And he broke down the walls, and now the community is coming in, and the, and the church is going out, and there's things happening. The community comes to the church and says, hey, we're, we, we need help with education. How can we work on this? And the church is saying, well, you know what? Why don't you use this wing of the building, and why don't we get a teacher over here? How can we do this? And they're starting to work together because God's opening doors. Faithful God looking after us in the simplest of ways, but getting hold of a pastor like Jose and probably Borden too and saying, you need to be outside the walls. Because that's where the ministry is right now. People don't come into a church because it's big, fancy, and pretty. They don't even care if your music's all that great. You need to go to them. You need to draw them in because of the love of Jesus Christ, and they will come. But boy, it's hard work. I'll pray for you on that one. Learning and celebrating together some of the pastors. Some of these pastors have like five and ten churches. They just kind of get assigned them, but they don't get all the education they need. And so we do a lot of theological training because we want pastors to be able to handle the word of God well and to get it out there. And then crisis. And we've all heard about crisis. This, I want to highlight Lebanon for you. Why would I highlight Lebanon? Ukraine's where it's all at. No, it's not. You see, one of the hardest things I've learned at CBM is the fact that emergencies happen time after time after time. And CNN tells me what I'm supposed to be worried about. And I get tired of being worried about Lebanon and then an earthquake and now it's Ukraine and then it's another earthquake. It's really hard to live like that. And I'm sure you all understand that. But we have very strong relationship with Lebanon. We've been working in Lebanon for probably 30 or more years. And we work right in Beirut, and we work with Syrian refugees. That's some of the work we're doing now. We also work at the Arab Baptist Theological Seminary. And the work that we do is really critical to these marginalized people from Syria. If you remember, Lebanese people don't play well with Syrians. And in fact, they, they war. They fight each other. It's really bad. So you can tell how bad it must be when the Syrians fleed their own country, came into Lebanon, and increased the population of Lebanon from 3 million to 4.5 million. There's probably a million and a half Syrians in Lebanon right now. But it's an old story. Y'all forgot about that, didn't you? And then there was an explosion that happened there a couple years ago, which made it even worse. And this is the pictures from the explosion. What I'm trying to share with you about emergency relief is that it's ongoing. It lasts a long period of time, and we work with partners, and we stay in the same spot. We can get money to emergencies all over the world immediately because we work with the Baptist World Alliance. So we've been putting a lot of money into Ukraine, as, as Jennifer shared, and we've been putting a lot of money into Lebanon. But you are right now looking at a Grow Hope project. And you may be saying, well, yeah, we're going to grow some corn up in Truro. What's that about? Well, basically, that corn is going to get sold. 
And the profits from that will go into what we call the Canadian Food Grains Bank. And the Food Grains Bank is made up of 15 denominations who withdraw from that bank. And when we withdraw from that bank, that money that went in there from the crops is matched by the Government of Canada. The Government of Canada realizes that they can't send money to Lebanon and expect it to go anywhere. If they want to feed people in Lebanon, it's better to work with people like the Canadian Food Grains Bank, the Baptist and the United Church and the, all the different denominations that are on this group because we can get food to the field and we can make sure that people are fed. And so that's what we do. So this, this crop here will help to feed people in Lebanon because we're going to withdraw that money and it's going to be matched a lot of times as much as three to one, sometimes four to one, and then we'll be able to take that, purchase food in Lebanon or purchase food next door in the other countries and we'll take it in and we'll feed people. And you're currently helping to feed 600 families in Lebanon. You've been doing that for several years. So that's big stuff. That's, that's the stuff that makes a difference in people's lives. It also leads people to the Lord. We don't do food for faith, but if you get food from a, another religion, and you're going, well, why are they giving us food and our own religion isn't? You might start to see and wonder, well, maybe their religion is a little better than mine. Or maybe, maybe their religion is more real. Maybe, maybe there's something happening here. And it's interesting to watch how many have come to know the Lord over the time. And that was one of the, the, the stories from Jennifer Lau, is how many people have come to know the Lord in Ukraine during the last year. There was over 6,000 baptisms in this year in Ukraine. Any idea how many churches we have in Ukraine? Baptist churches? One denomination. They're all Baptist. Any idea how many churches? Most of you will say, oh, man, it's a couple hundred, I imagine. No, it's 2,200. And the reason it's so large is we're the largest Protestant denomination, and it's all the same type of Baptist. It's a Baptist union that formed over the years as communism left, and this baptism grew, and, it's, and Baptists have grown. And we're a very strong denomination there, and they're very good at helping each other. And so when Lebanon, when, um, when, when uh, Ukraine, I, I, let me finish this slide. So I, I jumped ahead. Imagine that. I do that. <laughs> this is some of the food packages that we give to the Lebanese people for the month. It's, it doesn't look like much, but it actually stretches pretty good. And that's some of the stuff in there. I had the pleasure of being fed by a, uh, a Syrian woman, and she had fled, and we had been giving her this food. And it's really tough to accept cookies from a Syrian woman when you know that she's working from this food. But oh my, I would travel to get another one of those cookies. They were so good. It was a sesame cookie. It was awesome. And I just had some in New Glasgow when I was there at the farm market, but it was nowhere near as good as hers were. <laughs> but anyways, long story. Refugee camp there, uh, some of the work we've been doing. The updates, you, you heard some of the updates from, from Jennifer, so I won't go over them again. But we continue to do some really major work around uh, helping people in the Ukraine disaster, the Ukraine war, and we've been helping people to get out. We've been helping them, when they get out of Ukraine, all the countries around are hosting them, and many Baptist churches have been opening their doors, and many Baptist works have started as we've been helping to host what we call guests as they come out of Ukraine and get them onto other places. So some really significant work happening there, and uh, we've got a good reputation for the work that's happening. So I want to just thank you so much for your support because I know many of you have wanted to help with Ukraine. Please go to our website, cbmin.org, and you can help anytime with emergencies, including the one in, in um, Turkey. I interesting enough, the Hungarian Baptists, of all people, have this incredible quick rapid response rescue team. And they teach all over the world, and they go all over the world, and they, as soon as the invitation came for emergency relief, the Hungarians were on their way. And they took in seven rescue dogs, and they had trainers with them, and they had people going in. So just interesting how we work together internationally, and we were able to support some of that work, and we continue to support work in Ukraine. So that's sort of uh, much of what we do. 
That's the Grow Hope project here in Nova Scotia. This is what you're supporting. That's the corn combine that was picked up to buy, to, to help with our corn harvest. Uh, interesting to see it in the fall and in the spring. Um, the crops are smaller this year. We're only doing 10 acres this year. They've been having problems getting farmers involved because the farmers are running bigger plots now, so they can't move their equipment around. Um, I was driving down the highway a few years ago and I see this corn combine going down the highway in January. And I, I went, like I know Ian is the one driving it, and I'm going, what are you doing? <laughs> and he was harvesting the corn. We, we, we harvest the corn up here in Trill. It's, it's the lower grade of corn. So we can sit in the field for longer periods of time until it dries out. So we can harvest it actually in January. <laughs> Sometimes they had to do that because they had, don't, didn't always have the best of fields to put it in. But it was really funny to watch that thing going down the Trans-Canada Highway in January. It was like, okay now. <laughs> and anyways, but we produced. And God has blessed that uh, Grow Hope and uh, continues to do so. When you raise the money that you're hoping for, that 1200 that looks after about three acres of, of implants, of inputs. So that puts the seed in, it puts the fur fertilizer in, it helps us with the harvest, it looks after all those things. So thank you very much for helping with that. You guys are carrying a big burden on this one and we remember you. As soon as I mentioned I was going to Faith today, Ian who runs that project said, I know them, they support us really good. And I said, yes they do. <laughs> so he, he wants to thank you for that. And he's, he heads up Grow Hope Nova Scotia. That's how you can connect with us. Um, I would like though before I leave just to give, give you a little bit of, of a challenge. I want us all to be fair in what we do. First of all, please, please pray specifically for mission work. Find a mission work that catches your attention. It might be the emergency relief. It might be children's kids at risk. Find something and read up on it. You've, you've got a Tiding magazine out there. Tidings is an incredible magazine, a resource to find out what's happening, as is cbmin.org. Look us up on, online, and you'll find the projects that we're involved in. Please pray specifically for them. Find your passion and mission. Find something to get you right in the tummy. That's not right. That's a great way to find a mission that you want to support and can get involved in and learn about. So I challenge you to do that. Please consider monthly support. Uh, CBM, we have to fundraise in our churches and in our individually. The denomination just can't support us like they used to, and so we have to do more individual now. And so thank you for your support because you do make up a major amount of the support. And uh, thank you for being a part of the family that sends us out into the world uh, to embrace a broken world through word and deed. Thank you so much for that, for being part of CBM and for allowing us to represent you in many countries around the world. God bless you. I mean, I have a little prayer here. Lord God, thank you for the opportunity to speak, to share, to show how faithful you have been throughout the time that we have worked with CBM the last 150 years. God, you have sent us missionaries like the Matawanas. You've sent us people who have gone out into the world and made a difference. But more importantly, Lord, you have made a difference in the world through those who are local, those who know the situation, who have come to know you through one means or another, and you have blessed them, but you've challenged them, and they have learned how to share. They have learned how to be fair, and they have walked with you. God, help us to be united as we work together, and we thank you for the privilege of being a church that has enough that we can share, and we thank you for that opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen.